What makes a city good? What makes a city good is when all the people of the city in every sector, private, public, nonprofit, church, coaches, education, in every sector, operate off of a set of values that, that seeks the common good. What happens when people in one of those sectors goes in a different direction? For instance, what happens when business caves in to corporate greed or avarice and moves in a direction that ultimately undercuts the economy and their investors and everybody in that system. Well, bad things happen and cities are undermined, nations are undermined in that way. What's needed at that particular moment are people to stand up based on values, take a stand no matter what the risk, and make public what those issues are so that they can be corrected. Today we have one of those courageous people with us. His name is Mark Whitaker. He's chief of operations, president of operations for a, uh, a pharmaceutical company that serves nationally and internationally, Cypress Systems, and he's with us to talk about corporate ethics and what a difference one person can make. This is our city, and I'm H. Spees. It belongs to you, it belongs to me, the... this is our city. Well, Mark, what a joy to have you uh, with us on our show today, and, and uh, I think I misspoke at, actually in my introduction. It isn't a pharmaceutical company. It's a nutraceutical company. It's, it has to do with a piece of research that you as a, uh, a student and as a, a, a doctoral candidate really delved into, something dear to our valley, selenium. Tell us about it. That's correct. It's a, it's a biotechnology company, and, and our major product, our flagship product, is a product mineral known as selenium. And I actually did my Ph.D. research on the biochemical role of the selenium at the cellular level because it's used actually in the area of cancer, cancer prevention. I did my work at Cornell University in, in New York. Well, I was talking with uh, one of your associates and colleagues, Paul Ellis, uh, with the company, and, and he explained how this, this chemical actually reduces uh, cancer in people, and you're going into your next level of, uh, of trials and studies and all of that stuff. But that's not why we're here today. We're here today because you were a top business guy with a, with a Fortune 500 company that, uh, that started to go south, that ethically took a bad turn. Tell us about that. Okay, I was uh, divisional president. This is at age, when I was age 32. I'm 54 now. So in 1989, at age 32, I became the divisional president of the 56th largest company in America. Wow. Number 56 on the Fortune 500 is a company known as ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. And what you had for breakfast and lunch today most likely had something from ADM in it. I mean, it's in almost every food, wow. in, in every grocery yep. store around the world. They're 32 large. years old, and you were top uh, one of the top levels of that company. That's pretty heavy yeah. stuff for a young guy. Yes, I was divisional president, and um, I made... And I, and I got caught up a little bit in also in that greed. I was making millions of dollars a year with the stock options and the bonuses and the base salary. And, and, I, and I got caught up in that. But my wife also noticed a, a change in me that I was also not satisfied with some things that were going on. I've been with my wife since she was in seventh grade and I was in eighth grade. Wow. So we've been together for 40 years and been married for 32 years. So junior high sweethearts. Yes, junior high sweethearts. <laughs> absolutely. And so she, asked, she told, asked me what was on our mind, and I shared it with her that we were involved with a price-fixing scheme, that the company was involved with it for years, and they started to bring me into that price-fixing scheme. An international cartel, we were stealing about $1 billion a year from our own customers by gouging the prices with wow. our competitors. Explain what price-fixing is and why it's so terrible. Well, what price-fixing is when... When competitors get together on food additives and they charge higher prices for the ingredients that go into Kellogg cereal, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Kraft, the groceries that your viewers are buying in grocery stores every day, when those ingredients are artificially inflated by price fixing, where an international cartel was formed, the consumers pay for that. Wow. And they were paying an extra billion dollars a year to each company involved with this price fixing scheme. So ADM was benefiting about a billion dollars a year on that. And I told my wife that and, and within an hour... Uh, we were sitting with the FBI exposing that whole that whole case. Wow, because incredible. Of, because of my wife's encouragement to really, she knew it was weighing heavily on my mind, and because of her encouragement, uh, we, we exposed it to the FBI. And I became informant the next day for the FBI. So you became an FBI informant because of the, the huge implications of, uh, I mean, we have laws against companies 
eliminating competition by secretly coming together and basically creating a secret illegal tax upon consumers is what exactly, you, what you exactly, guys were, exactly. were were doing antitrust laws basically how did how did they suck you into that deal well being age 32 and the money that i made and the money i earned and our ceo was 75 our president was in his high 60s and i was 32 seven years out of college so i really felt like well, they must know what they're doing. They've been here for years, and so what they're doing, it must be okay. It must be the right way of doing business. But it, I really could tell that it wasn't. We were dealing from our own consumers. and it, But I will say the reason why I got involved with it was to stay at the company, I had to. I mean, you, if you're going to stay and move up in the company, you had to become a part of that culture. You had to become and a I just part of the leave, inner circle. And you... I just couldn't leave that salary package and yeah. that bonus package. Yeah. I couldn't leave it. It was I, a lure. Yeah. It, and, and to get into that inner circle and that higher level, you had to drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. And I was living in this 13,000 square foot house with this eight car garage. And, and at age 32, That's it meant everything. Stuff. Materialism yep. Absolutely. was a big factor at that point. But Ginger had a problem with it. She did. She did. Everything was black and white. And when I told her, I said, well, if we expose the FBI about this crime that also I've been doing for a few months myself, even though the company was already involved for several years, that I could go to prison, we could lose our home, our kids would no longer be in private schools, and she said she'd rather be homeless than be involved with a household where illegal activity was occurring. Wow. So not she bad was for her. about it. Not, was she a stay-at-home mom? Stay-at-home mom raising three young children at not the time. Not bad for a stay-at-home mom yeah. that's enjoying the good life. Yeah. So when you made that decision together to become an FBI informant within this huge company, what did that, how did that begin to affect your day-to-day -day life? It was a different kind of life. Basically, after we exposed the FBI the day that I told my wife, it was that quick, we told the FBI that very day, on November 5th, 1992, I started wearing a wire within, within two days. And I had a wire in my jacket, uh, a wire in a notebook, and a wire in my briefcase. And they would meet me at 6 in the morning, shave my chest to hook the microphones. Wow. And I would do that every day for, for three years. I wore three a wire every three years. years. And I'd meet with them till midnight, two or three nights a week, to turn over all the tapes and for the debriefings to disclose all the evidence that I was collecting what, for three what, years. How did that, I mean, that, is, that, that type of life has got to wear on you. It does. And matter of fact, uh, the FBI has a guideline now that you can't wear a wire longer than a year because of what happened in my case. It, you just can't do it. You lose your identity worth wearing a wire for three years. You don't know who you work for. Do you work for ADM? Do you work for the FBI? And You work for some three-letter company. You just don't exactly, know which one exactly, it is. <laughs> exactly. It was the longest person to wear a wire, longest duration of anybody in U.S. history. Wow. Three years. So then the, the, uh, that, that process took place. They used all that evidence to, and you, yours, your evidence that you generated as an informant was the, the, the foundation for the FBI and the U.S. government to go after ADM. Yes, they prosecuted. Executives went to prison. All the companies involved were prosecuted. Everybody was prosecuted in that in this case based on those tapes alone wow. that I made. Wow. Huge impact. Yes. And that's a, that's a landmark decision that ba basically woke up the entire U.S. Uh, corporate world and, uh, and, and kind of set the record straight. Uh, in that process, you got caught in the middle. What happened? I did. Well, after wearing a wire for, for a couple of years, and when the FBI told me they were getting close to having enough evidence where they weren't going to need any more evidence, I, I knew that I was going to be fired for being a whistleblower. So I had $9.5 million. I paid $9.5 million to myself. I based on what I would earn over the next three years, what I felt like my stock options would be worth, yep. knowing that I would gonna, was going to have to get back <coughs> on my feet for being a whistleblower. So I had nine and a half million dollars set aside. I knew the company couldn't come after me because if they ever came after me and said, Mark, we're going to prosecute you for nine and a half million dollar fraud, I'd say, you guys are stealing a billion dollars a year every year from your right. own customers. Right. So I was protected there. But once they knew that I was informant, they immediately told the FBI and the media, rightfully so, that, hey, your white knight is not a white knight informant. There's a nine and a half million dollars he didn't tell the FBI about. Wow. And so you were, you were caught, boom, between... Yeah. between two sides of forces that were beyond your control. Were you a Christian at this time? I went to church my entire life. I grew up in a Christian family, yep. and I went to church my entire life every weekend. But it really, I, wasn't, if, I didn't become a believer until age 41, three months in prison. And I learned then there was a big difference between, between a Christian and really relying on Christ and going to church wow. at age 41. Wow. So Incredible. I was not a Christian at that time. I was not a believer at that time. 
Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at a clip because in this clip, this is an interesting clip because in this clip, the, the, the head of the FBI team that was utilizing your information and actually cultivating it comes out on your behalf. You ended up being incarcerated for, for how long? For nine years in prison, nine from age 41 years. to age 49. Wow. And, uh, and this, this FBI, uh, this leader in the FBI came out on your behalf and that's what this clip is all about. Let's yeah. take a look. Okay. Dean Paisley is what you'd expect a 25-year veteran of the FBI to be. He's a very honest, straight shooter, and he knows Mark Whitaker very well. He was the FBI supervisor in the ADM Mark Whitaker price fixing case, and he says this question mark should not be on this title. He says that he has no question that Mark Whitaker is a national hero. But in the early 1990s, Mark Whitaker was keeping a $9 million secret from Dean Paisley, and it was a secret he would regret. My biggest regret would be, my biggest regret would be that I didn't tell the FBI about the money issue during the time that I was working with the FBI. But those in the FBI who were working with Mark Whitaker to build a case against ADM were shocked when their own informant was sent to prison for nine years. It was the first time in history that anybody had been a, a cooperative witness for the FBI and was prosecuted in the same case that they were assisting. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Dean Paisley worked for the FBI for 25 years. He was the FBI supervisor during the Mark Whitaker ADM case. He is not a fan of the movie The Informant. I know from experience going through that uh, that uh, it wasn't a comedy. It was anything but a comedy. Would you be willing to wear a wire? We need your help. And the 25-year FBI veteran is also not laughing at the treatment that Mark Whitaker has received. I always felt that he didn't get a fair shake, uh, either from the FBI or the uh, uh, system. He didn't deserve all that happened to him. Dean Paisley is now working to get a presidential pardon for Mark Whitaker, who he says is a national hero. He helped every citizen in this world that ever bought any product from ADM. Had he not stolen that nine million, uh, he would have been a national hero at the highest levels, really. Dean Paisley says he and the other main FBI officers who worked this case are now pressing for a full presidential pardon for Mark Whitaker. And at least one prosecutor who helped send Whitaker to prison is also helping in their effort. Wow, that's high drama. Yeah. I mean, movies are done, and you actually had a movie. In fact, Matt Damon played you. Well, he's my identical twin, so there's <laughs> only one choice. <laughs> And it's, and it's not just that Dean Paisley, the, the one that, that presented on that clip, all four FBI agents and my prosecutor are all that supportive. Very, very supportive today. And they've, they've gone after Did you ever receive that pardon? No, I haven't. The average number of years someone's out of prison for a presidential pardon is 28 and a half years. Wow. And I've been out of prison for five years this month. So it's a very political process. And actually their support, pushing for the pardon, has probably been as valuable it has been a part in itself because they have went public in numerous locations, in numerous media outlets, uh, really, with their, with their story of support. Well, let's, let's go back to the heart of the issue, which is this price-fixing thing and corporate greed. How, how big an issue is corporate greed in our world today, in, in 20, 2011 going into 2012? It is a huge issue, and that was one of the largest, the ADM case was one of the largest price-fixing cases in U.S. history. But it's starting to pale in comparison compared to the Madoff case and some of the cases that have come out since AIG. then, Enron and WorldCom and AIG and, and Tyco. And I don't think there's an end to it. I, I really think we're going to see more cases to come. I really do. I think corporate greed is the problem we're having on Wall Street today because of what we were doing at ADM is being magnified and happening everywhere. Yeah. As you, you know, you, you now have the opportunity to talk to business groups and, and faith-based groups and people all over the country about this issue of corporate greed. What is your message, Mark? Well, my message is, is, is always think long-term because most people involved with corporate greed, they start thinking short-term. Their salary gets based a lot on stock options of public companies, so they're thinking how can they get the stock up each quarter because the quarter earnings, earnings get reported every quarter. 
So if you look at the downfall of Enron and WorldCom and you look at the ADM scandal, a lot of that was based on trying to get that stock price as high as we could every three months. We should have been looking five years down the road, ten years down the road. Right. We were thinking too short term. Yes. We need to change tracks and start thinking long term. Another thing we need to do is start thinking, we're always thinking about shareholders' value. What's the best way to get the stock price up? We should be thinking about purpose mm. and have passion for our work and passion for our products. Because if we're thinking so short term and we're thinking strictly at shareholders' value, there's going to be a train wreck, uh, train wreck yes. that happened, like yep. what happened, what happened yep. at ADM. So thinking long term instead of short term and, and thinking instead of just shareholder value and money. Yeah. Uh, really thinking about the purpose, right, and the community the and the community around the us. The common good, exactly. And the community involves your customers too. We were ripping off our customers through that price fixing scheme. We should have been working with our customers to assist them to have better foods in yes. the marketplace. And instead, we were gouging with their price to get our, our our prices up. And we're a seventy billion dollar company in ADM, seventy billion legally. Wow. Why would you steal another billion dollars? Right. But it shows what greed can do. Right. It's never, it's never enough. Never enough. Well, we're going to take a little break now so that the station can identify itself and people can learn more about KNXT. But when we come back, we want to talk more about the implications of corporate greed and what the average person can do about it. We'll be right back. Okay, well, we are here with uh, Mark Whitaker, Ph.D., President of Operations for Cypress Systems, and uh, his, his partner and uh, colleague, Paul Willis, is here in the audience with us today here at KNXT. And uh, we're talking about corporate ethics and corporate greed. You talked before the break, Mark, about uh, some of the things that an individual can do to, to anchor themselves in uh, ethical decision-making. One was thinking long-term rather than short-term, and rather than just thinking about the money delivered to shareholders, to think about the purpose of the company. Uh, what are some other keys and elements, some, some pillars that we can build a, an ethical corporate framework on? Okay. Well, besides purpose, in addition, attached to that purpose is to think about the community. Besides, we realize a company has to be profit-making, but it also has to be good for the community, and the, and the community also involving the customers that were that we're serving. So besides just shareholder value, it should be purposeful and also community minded. Yes. And another thing is we I feel executives need to balance their life better. I look at how I and the mm -hmm. other three executives that went to prison at ADM, how we got off track. We became workaholics and everything it came about how we can increase shareholder value, how we can make more money right. based on our stock options. Does and the word idolatry ring true there? Yes, it does. It does. What, and we, and what, what, so idolatry isn't just kneeling down before some idol. It's it, 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 it sounds like it's a lifestyle that we can easily get sucked into because it's so lucrative. It is. It is because you get these rock star type salaries because most executives make millions of dollars. Yeah. And you get addicted to those millions of dollars and you forget the community around you. And I feel we need to balance our lives better as executives and be part of the PTA. Be active in our church. Be active in, in some of the community groups. And the more you're active with that, the more you're going to have your company more involved with things that have greater purpose yeah. than just shareholders' value. And also, I think one needs to know their value system. 
if your value system is clear, my wife made a decision within five minutes. Wow. We're going to expose this case. And she was a stay-at-home mom raising three young kids. I've, the, on your website, you, you basically said she's the national hero. She really is. Not me. She really is. That uh, was a powerful statement. I believe I would have still, I believe ADM would have still been fixing price today, and I could have been a part of that today if it wasn't for my wife putting her, her foot down and exposing that case. Wow. Because she had such a clear value system that, that it was so clear that she was going to expose it. But if your value system is not clear, that's when you can find yourself decision-making to be hard and you can find yourself in the eye of the storm. And that's where I found myself. And that's why I was involved with this price fixing for five or six months wow. before it was exposed wow. because I, I just didn't know if I could give up that income and, and give those things up. This is a huge message because what you what you've just said is that a little old girl who you met in the seventh grade, a stay-at-home mom who simply had crystal clear values, ended up being the key to you bringing down a company. Yeah, and bringing down one of the biggest companies in the world, and the cartel was an international cartel involving companies around the world. So any of our viewers at home that, that think that you have to be the CEO of a company to make a difference... The answer is no. No, you absolutely don't. Ginger did it. Yes. Because her values were clear. And she hadn't worked in the corporate world for 15 years. Wow. At that point, because her value system was, was so clear. You, you mentioned coming to Christ, and we're going to get to that in a, in a minute, but after your incarceration. But prior to that, you, you made a move. And the move that you made makes sense. You realize that by the end of this long, protracted informant process, three years wearing a wire, getting all goofy in terms of yeah. who, who am I working for. Yeah. And risking my life. Too. And, and risking your life because, yeah, when, when billions are on the table, then it, it becomes a, an issue of life and death. Uh, in the middle of that, you did something to protect yourself and your family, which was illegal. What, mm -hmm. Describe that a little more clearly. What, what did you do? Well, I basically paid $9.5 million to myself from the company because I had a, a lot of authority. But I had to get signatures from people above me that anything over 250000 But I got the signatures from the executives because how could they not? They're, they're involved in stealing a billion dollars right. a year in a price-fixing scheme. How could they not accept? Right. And they're expecting me to be a part of it. How could they not accept accept that compensation, that $9.5 million extra dollars? But the problem is once they learned I was the informant, it's... And it's the, everybody goes under right, the bus. Right, they threw you under the yes. bus. And, yeah, once and, they learned I was the informant. And then, and then you went on trial. Well, I didn't go on trial. I, 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 I eventually pled out, but it, it, okay. it, I fought for a couple of years prior to pleading out. I could have got a lot lower sentence. They had the, the, the FBI agent still supported me even with the fraud, and they had an agreement with the prosecutors, and also I had a, a lawyer that they helped me find that actually had an agreement with the prosecutors that was going to be a three-year agreement for prison, a yeah. uh, three-year plea deal. But they felt like with the presentation that the FBI agents make to the judge could get it down to six months. So my lawyer felt a good chance for a six-month sentence. And I fired that lawyer, distanced myself from the government, fought for two more years, and ended up with nine years. Wow. When I probably could have had a six-month. I just, my mindset at that time, I just not, the pride was in my way. I could not accept the felony wow. at that part of my life. And wow. also after wearing a wire for three years, I wasn't thinking very clearly either at that point. So you got Ginger, who's crystal clear about her values, but you got a guy who has a family. You still got some pride. You're trying to cut deals, and it got you into big trouble. Yeah, big trouble. And it ended you into into the into prison. Yes. Three months in, what happens? Well, actually, before I went to prison, I attempted suicide twice. Wow. I didn't think I could accept. In my mind, I just couldn't wow. handle nine years of yeah. prison, and I knew that was ahead of me. So I attempted suicide twice. And a person from the Christian Businessman Connection, we were living in Chapel Hill at the time, came start, read that about the suicide attempt and about the fact that I was going to go to prison. And he came to my house and met with me two or three nights a week for four months before I entered prison for Bible study. Wait a minute. Yes. This is another hero. What yes. was his name? Ian Howes is his name. Ian Howes yeah. reads about you in the paper. Yeah. His heart is broken over your suicide, Yes. attempted suicide. And he comes and spends how long? Four months, two or three nights a week for hours each night. For four months wow. before I entered prison. And that planted a seed. I didn't become a believer yet, but that planted the seed. But then I continued that as I entered prison. And three months into prison is when I really became a believer, age 41, even though I went to church my whole life. That's when I really brought the Holy Spirit into my heart and really relied on Christ for guidance. And miracles started happening after that point. Tremendous miracles. You were, you were searching. Yes. So you, you, you're in prison. 
And uh, what, was the, what was the tipping point in prison? You'd had, Ian had laid the foundation. Yeah. You go into prison. What happened at that three-month period? Well, the, t- the tipping point, I wasn't sleeping hardly at all during those three months. And I had these burdens. The divorce rate for people in prison, if you're five years or longer, it's a 99% divorce rate. So I was thinking, uh, my junior high sweetheart, would we even be married wow. when I got out? Statistics said we wouldn't be. I also looked at it. She was a stay-at-home mom. We lost everything in this case. How would they survive raising three young children financially? She hadn't worked for almost 15 years. A third one was, would the FBI ever forgive me for not telling them everything? And they became my friends, working with them for yep. three years, like family. Would they ever yes. forgive me, the four agents? And then a fourth one, would I be employable? I had an Ivy League PhD in biochemistry from Cornell, but still a convicted felon, nine years of prison. Would I be employable? Wow. So those four burdens were so great yes. that I said, and after reading the Bible and after Ian Howes planted that seed, I had to put it on shoulders bigger than mine. And that's when I brought Christ in my life and I relied on for guidance because his shoulders could handle it and mine couldn't. You just, you, you gave up. You surrendered. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, we're going we're gonna to do another show. Uh, we're going to turn this around and do another show. This one was on corporate greed and, and how individuals can make a difference, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or whether you're a a guy in the system who finally says, you know what, enough is enough and I'm going to take a stand. But uh, we, we want to hear your personal story, so we're going to do another session. But before we leave today, we've we got about a minute left, could you share with folks in the business world uh, a, a challenge as it relates to ethics and the whole concept that enough is enough? Well, people in the business community this generation we have to change. There's so many scandals. You look at the Penn State, the Tiger Woods, the John Edwards when he was running for president and senator. They're just, it's not just all illegal activity. It's just scandal after scandal at the corporate level and in, and in politics. And we have to make a change and we have to really take a stand that always do the right thing no matter how long term it's going yeah. to take us to get there. Beautiful. We have to do the right thing. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you very much. Well, folks, you just heard an incredible testimony from a guy who has been through uh, very huge obstacles uh, on the road to telling the truth. And then having truth impact him personally in a prison cell as he surrendered his life to Christ. Uh, We're going to hear more from Mark Whitaker in in our next show, but let me just pause and remind us of our premise today, and that is that anyone can make a difference. And in Mark's words, by looking long range, by focusing on value, by remembering our responsibility to the community, and then by just simply taking a stand, we can make a huge difference. This is our city. My name is H. Spees. It belongs to you. It belongs to me. This is our city.